Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. It's the second most in-demand job being a CPA. It's the third best job listed by U.S. News and World Report. Employment of accountants and auditors is expected to grow faster through the year 2022 than any other occupation. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, the CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. That clip was from Tim Garrity. And yes, it's the Tim Garrity of Becker CPA Review. This was a fun interview to do. Even if you're well past taking the exam yourself, I think you're going to enjoy the conversation I have with Tim. Naturally, we get into some of Tim's insights into passing the CPA exam, but we actually spend just as much time, if not more, covering how he started his career, ended up getting into teaching, and quite a bit actually about the operations of his boutique accounting practice, Garrity and McIntyre. They've been in business since around 1980, so that's a story in and of itself. This really is a great conversation. I definitely enjoyed it, and I'm sure you will too. Tim is quite a character. If you do find value in this episode for yourself, please check us out online at our website. It's www.whereaccountantsgo.com. We have all kinds of audio and written accounting career-focused materials. We have books, we have blogs, we have, of course, other podcasts, and even a few tools for employers as well. If you're looking to grow your own career, one of the publications you may want to look into is our book, 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career. What we've done is we've taken some of the best advice from our 100 or so podcast, boiled it down into these 49 tips to help you improve on and continue to grow your own accounting career. You can find it on Amazon, of course, and you can find it for immediate shipping on our website at whereaccountsgo.com. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Tim Garrity. Well, hello, Tim. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I'm excited that we have a chance to interact. Wonderful. Well, for the audience, we have Tim Garrity in New York on the show with us today. And if you recognize Tim's name, that could be for several reasons. But in all likelihood, it's probably because you took the Becker CPA review at some point. Tim's been with Becker since 1980, believe it or not. He's known as the Dean of CPA Review. He's their editor-in-chief and also the national lead instructor for Becker. Plus, he's been recognized by Accounting Today on the list of the top 100 most influential people in accounting. So definitely a major influencer in our profession. There's a lot more to Tim's story, though, than just the Becker experience, and we're going to hit upon that as well today. So, Tim, I I definitely want to cover your story and your history with Becker, but I really do want to make sure we get insight into the rest of your career career also. What initially led you to think about pursuing accounting as a possible career in the first place? I guess the best way that I can describe it is like any other young little child, I did the paper route. I did the snow shoveling. I did the leaf raking. I did the car washing to make money and make ends meet. But pretty quickly, I decided I don't like a lot of physical labor. I decided that maybe I would try to do something a little bit different. And as I grew up a little bit more, I started to find that if you used your brain power, you could make as much, if not more, and didn't leave you exhausted at the end of the day. In fact, I recall once when I was in college, I was dating this young lady, and she brought me home to meet her father. And I immediately shook his hand and said, it's a pleasure to meet you. And as he grabbed my hand, his first comment was, these are not the hands of a working man. And I proudly said to him, no, these are the hands of a thinking man. And he laughed, and we got along for a while. So I thought to myself, this is the path for me. Well, when I first started college, I thought, well, I'm going to go to law school. Everybody goes to law school. That's where everybody wanted to be. And I had a chance to meet with a family friend who happened to be a judge here in the New York, New Jersey area. And he told me, political science majors are a dime a dozen. Either get into computers or get into accounting. And I took his advice. And while computers interested me, accounting 
literally lit me up. I just loved the whole idea of understanding the language of business. So that's really what started and motivated me. Now, eventually, of course, I did pursue other avenues as well, but that was the initial reason why I decided to get into the field of accounting. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So were you pursuing your law degree at the same time? Am I understanding that correctly? Or? Well, when I was in college, I only majored in accounting. And okay. I always anticipated that I would eventually use it in order to go to law school to match the two up. But I knew that to really have an impressive academic career and literally impress the admissions office of a law school, having the CPA license would be paramount. And then ironically, I started getting jobs as summer interns between my sophomore and junior and then my junior and senior year in the field of accounting. Companies in the local area were looking for interns, and I happened to get the job. And once again, no physical labor, so it really was attractive to me. And I started to really flourish in that area and heard a lot of good things about the opportunities. So I continued to pursue it, graduated, started working in what was then known as the Big Eight, now, of course, known as the Big Four, soon probably to be known as the humongous one if things continue the way they have been going. And I thought, you know what, I'll stay there for a few years, I'll go back to law school, and then I'll remeasure things. So, yes, I kind of had a dual path planned for myself right from the beginning. Okay. I just have to ask, that first job, tax, audit, something different, what were you doing? Well, my very first professional job was working in the summer for two companies that were merging. You may remember a company called Singer, as in Singer Sewing Machines. They had gotten into and dabbled with the idea of computers, weren't very successful. So they decided to sell out to a company called TRW. And as luck would have it, our college placement office had posted a job opportunity for some interns to help with their inventory calculations. I applied and was fortunate enough to be one of the people they selected. And it really worked out well. I started to really get to know computers well in advance of most people back in the mid and late 70s. Right after that, of course, I had an internship with what now is known as KPMG. Then it was known as Pete Marwick Mitchell, and they offered me a job when I graduated, and I accepted it. And then what happened was kind of interesting. In my state, you are not allowed to sit for the exam until after you graduated. So I couldn't sit for the exam until November. I put in the time, was successful in passing all four parts, and apparently the reputation got out pretty quickly in my office that my notes were like gold because I had used analogies and I had made extra notes on the side and people started using them. And I started realizing, hey, I'm pretty good at this stuff. So it also helped encourage me to possibly consider alternative courses in the future. Interesting. Now, you know, I have to ask this. Did you take a review course? Yes, I did. And of course, the course was the Becker CPA review course. It was <laughs> okay. at the time pretty much the only course that everyone knew about and, you know, firms were talking about it. Unfortunately, back in those days, I had to shell out the money myself. They didn't reimburse like they do today, but I never regret the investment I made to pass the CPA exam. Wonderful. Now, for the audience, I did not know about Becker back then. So honestly, I wasn't sure where we were going to go with that question, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> So take us through your career from those first couple jobs to starting your own practice, just you know, whatever the high points are. Sure. One of the things was I decided when I was going to major in accounting, one of the things I looked at was my dad, who happened to be in law enforcement, always used to joke and say, there are only three jobs that are guaranteed in a depression, police, bartenders, and accountants. Well, I knew that he was police, and I didn't really have that interest in going into law enforcement that way. Bartender, I had done that in college, and I realized you live on tips, and it's not all that lucrative long term. So the accounting, of course, applied. The JD, well, the law degree was because we had family members who were lawyers. And, of course, I also noted one other thing. All my friends from high school and college whose families were very well off, their parents were typically lawyers and accountants. And I thought, you know what? If this is what it takes to live successfully financially, I think I'm willing to try to give it a shot. So that's the way I started. So I started by working in public, as I said, with what was then known as Pete Marek Mitchell, now known as KPMG, passed the exam, continued for a couple of years, both in the audit and the tax side. I kind of split my time between the two. I really enjoyed both. Then eventually, after my three to four years of being there, I decided, let me go back now and get my law degree. So as I went back, I said, I'm going to take a year off. I told the office, I need a year. I want to get that first year under my belt because I had also, during this time, had gone nights for my master's degree. So I said, just give me the one year so I can balance things out and I'll be back. Well, before I even started, 
I got a phone call from a local college professor who said to me that one of their teachers had suffered a heart attack and wasn't going to be able to teach the fall semester. And he said, we've heard a little bit about you. We know that you've already got a CPA. You've already got a master's degree. Any chance you can possibly fill in and be a teacher for us? Here I was, like 25 years old, and I was like, yeah, but here's my class schedule at law school, and I don't have any control over it. They mandate what classes you take, and you have no choice. And they said, we'll work around that. So the next thing I knew, here I was going to law school full-time, and I was a full-time college professor. From there, all of a sudden, I had a couple of friends who needed help in being entrepreneurs themselves. So I started doing some tax returns on the side, helped them by doing some bank reconciliations, do payroll tax returns, etc. And then fast forward a little bit further, apparently I did a good job at the university because one of their students made a recommendation to their professor who was running a CPA review course that I may be a good addition to their staff. And lo and behold, before too long, while I was still in law school, I was literally a full-time professor, and I started teaching CPA review, and I had a very, very modest little side CPA practice going. So all of a sudden, I found myself graduating, and I was making three times the amount that I had back in public accounting, and I was my own boss. And I made the decision, you know what? I think I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to try to stay on my own if I can, and hopefully it'll be successful. And if not, well, I'll reassess at some future point in time. So that's how it all started. Interesting. Were you teaching for Becker at that point? Well, I actually met a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ivan Fox, who wrote the most used business law book in the nation. Mm -hmm. And we got started together as in a course, and we became very, very successful. And inevitably, the parent company of Becker, which is now known as Atellum, had bought Becker, and then they came to me and offered me a position. So I joined them. Interesting. Okay. Now, you've been teaching Becker for such a long time. And I know a couple of people in our local market, I'm down in Texas, that taught for a while and then really enjoyed it. But, you know, eventually moved on to other things. What's kept you doing it this long? Obviously, you find joy in the work. So what do you enjoy about it so much? I love knowledge. It's one of my favorite pastimes is reading, learning, exploring, and advancing my own career. And I love the idea of then learning to explain that to other people. I've always had that, whether it was in sports and explaining how a play worked after practice to the younger people. When I was in high school, when you were a junior, you had to mentor the freshmen, and then you continued to mentor them when you were a senior. So I got to know kids and work with them and explain why plays were done, why your position did this or that, etc. So I was really used to that. And then, of course, in college, I was part of a fraternity, and we were always trying to help each other pass the various tests. And I seemed to grasp things and had an unusual way of explaining them. It seemed to work for most people. So I really enjoyed that. And of course, as you have success in something, you usually gravitate to want to do it even more. So that was probably part of the reason why I did it. And then, of course, when the acquisition, they acquired my company, Fox Garrity, and I remember the people at Atelum telling me this was going to be small fish eating large fish, where I was going to take over and be the editor-in-chief, and I would have the opportunity to write the new textbooks, and work with some of the most exciting people in the industry, people who only some of the old timers like myself would recognize these names. But I got to work with the Newt Becker. I got to work with Richard Convisor and Rick Duffy, who had formed a very large course called Convisor Duffy, which also had been acquired. I got to work with the people from Person Walensky, and I also got to work with a person who became a very dear friend of mine, Bob Minette, who owned his own course called Gross Minette. All of these people were entrepreneurs incredibly talented, and we were able to take the best of all those programs and put them together. And they asked me to literally lead the charge. How exciting is that, to be working with some of the best people in the industry with reputations that far exceeded mine and be able to learn from them and literally build something new, better, and exciting for the next generation of CPA candidates. That just kept me motivated for so many years. Wow. And at the same time, you were operating your accounting park? Yeah, I had started it, and unfortunately, it was too lucrative to want to give up. One of the things that was a little bit of a sticking point when I was being acquired by the former, the Atellum Group was, you know, they said, well, you know, you serve two Caesars. And I was able to convince them that they actually had a tremendous amount of synergies. I said, first of all, I really have to know the material and the new accounting and auditing and tax rules in order to serve my clients. And then in serving my clients, I learn how these get implemented, how the industry uses them, 
what are the learning key points that have to be taught to these companies? And then I can bring those stories and examples back into the classroom. And I think that's been one of the positive things that I've been able to do is people always tell me, not only do you teach this stuff, but then you give it real world examples that I can latch onto and I can hold onto. And I think that's something that's so important is to have that fundamental understanding of how does it apply to the workforce and how are you going to use it? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Tell us about your firm now. I'm curious because I don't know anything about Garrity and McIntyre other than, you know, the name. I'm assuming there's at least one other partner there. <laughs> there's one other partner. We have about 14 people working here. It's not a monstrous firm. Of course, when you're okay. not large, you always call yourself a boutique organization. So I'm going to use that term. I guess it's the proper term to use. But we do serve a lot of very exciting corporations. Part of that reason is is because I go to many, many of the Fortune 100 companies and I do CPE on a regular basis. CPE, by the way, is continuing professional education. And since I'm doing CPE, often controllers, CFOs, directors of accounting policy will approach me afterwards and say, hey, you know, I understand you also have an accounting practice. Would you guys help us with, whether it's a transfer pricing on an international basis or possibly if, can you help us with some reconciliations of one of our subs or, you know, trans, some other type of transaction? And that's kind of really worked out very, very well. So most of the people here all had public accounting, most of them with the big eight or big four accounting firms. They're all CPAs and they are all really wonderful people. I'm very pleased to say that, you know, the average tenure with our firm is 20 plus years at this point in time. So everybody seems to enjoy the kind of clients we serve and the type of work that we provide to them. Okay. And are you still functioning as a managing partner? Yep. I am still the managing partner. I'm still the one who signs the checks and signs off on most of the financial statements we do, et cetera, and things like that. Yep. And I'm part of the meetings. In fact, today, before we had this particular item, I spent the whole day working on the practice side of life. Wow. Yeah, the audience won't know this because this is going to come out closer to mid-April, but we're recording this right before the March 15th deadline. I have to say I was very impressed and a little surprised that we were going to be able to do this. (laughs) Well, actually, for your audience, we're actually filming this on Pi Day. March 14th is 3.14. Do you remember from math, Pi? That's right. Us math majors always like to refer to it as Pi Day. (laughs) <laughs> you are truly an instructor. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you mean that as a compliment. <laughs> yes, yes. I know I'm switching back and forth a little bit. It's just you have a very interesting story. You've had your practice as well now for such a long time. What are some of the things that have either surprised you about being self-employed or you know, running your own business or that you had to learn? Let me start with When I first became an accounting major and became a CPA, even when I had gone to law school, you know, my friends kind of looked at me as like, okay, you know, you're smart, but you're boring. You know, these are my buddies that I go drinking with. They wanted to talk sports. They wanted to talk about other things. And of course, I loved accounting. But you know what I found out? As soon as I could help them save taxes, I became a really interesting person to them. All of a sudden, it was like, hey, Tim, you know, I've got this three-bedroom apartment, and one of the rooms I'm using as my office at home, you know, what kind of deductions can I get, and how can I use my car as a deduction, et cetera? And while the questions were pretty straightforward back then, boy, it really helped magnify my relationship with them and then became, obviously, their accountant. So that was probably the first thing was once you can help somebody, you really curry favor with them. What I did discover, though, was a lot of new skills were needed. When I first started on my own, I learned that I had to go from being just a technician to learning how to manage other people, not only managing other people, but then becoming a salesperson and then becoming a salesperson, learning how to finance the business and manage the cash flow. And I learned very, very quickly that you manage things and you have to lead people. There's a distinction between the two. And that took me a while. And in fact, I really understood that there was a big difference between small entrepreneurship and large corporations. In fact, one of my dearest friends happened to have been the CFO of a major Fortune 100 company. And when ultimately it was acquired by another Fortune 100 company, his job was eliminated. The other CFO won the job. So he went out, you know, Tim, I'm going to start my own consulting practice. I had so much experience and I have a reputation. Well, after a few months, he came to me and he said, I didn't realize all the new skills you have to learn when you're an entrepreneur. He said, I'm so used to looking at things at the high level, and now I'm down in the bushes, and I'm literally, you know, raking the leaves, so to speak. And I said, yeah. So obviously, you know, that was part of it. And my dad always told me that if all you want to be is an employee, you'll work 40 hours. If you're a manager, you're probably up to 50 hours a week. 
become the boss, and it's 60 hours. And if you want to be the owner of a company, figure about 80 hours a week is going to be your normal. And I realized, you know, the higher up you go, it's not easier. It's more challenging. And that was probably part of the learning curve that I had to take as I've gone through it. And by the way, I don't even want to infer that I haven't stopped learning. Every day I'm learning something different, something new that can help improve my business. And then I can bring that into the practice and I can bring that into our training programs. You really do bring a lot of value to the review course because you're still in it every day. You know, I'm very active in the profession outside of just teaching. I can see that. That really is good value. Sorry, I was just reflecting a little bit on your story there. That's all right. If you want to keep sending compliments my way, I'll keep quiet for a while. (laughs) I never object to a compliment. (laughs) Well, I'm sure you talk about this all the time, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask. Give us some tips for passing the exam. What do you think people are doing well these days with respect to working on passing the exam? Boy, that's an important question, isn't it? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is one of the mottos I always tell when I'm speaking to students in a classroom environment, say in college, to convince them, I'll always say, remember, today's preparation will determine tomorrow's achievements. I tell them there's three C's that go into this. Now, the three C's are, first of all, have confidence. And I always like to remind them, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So have confidence because if you believe in yourself, that is one of the biggest steps towards passing this exam. I've seen kids who've come from second tier and third tier schools who only had C averages because they were working so hard and now all of a sudden found themselves not getting that full-time job upon graduating. And they said, you know what? I'm going to take the next couple of months and I'm going to bust my chops and I'm going to do whatever it takes to pass the exam. I'll take that kid any day of the week because they're determined and they're confident they can do it. The second C is commitment. I always like to tell them there's no right way to do something wrong. So figure out how to do it right. And from there, the third C is choose the right course of action. Now, for some people, that may be self-study. I'm not going to try to sell anybody on only our course. There's different reasons that people will do different alternatives. But what I'm always going to tell them is be aware when you look at it, because some courses of action will give new meaning to the term cruel and unusual punishment. We've all had the horrible teacher or the horrible book that doesn't help us at all. So make an informed decision about how you're going to attack this exam. That's some of the biggest items that you have to do. And if you do those things, then you ultimately make that commitment. You have the confidence. You choose the right course of action for you. Then under those circumstances, you've got a tremendous chance to pass the CPA exam. Mm. So we have a general audience, obviously. And so give us some tough love tips. What do you see people doing wrong? What are some of the pitfalls? When you see people not passing the exam, what do they need to know? Another great question. My experience, and I've had, unfortunately, 40 years of experience. You know, I've been out here for a long time. Typically, one, they literally are missing one of the three C's. Either they lack confidence, and the first time that they have any failure, whether it's on a pretest that they've done through the course or whether it's they took a part and they didn't quite get the numbers they wanted, they literally start wobbling and they decide, well, this is not for me. I'm not that kind of a person anyway. Have the confidence. Keep going back. As I always like to say, you're never measured by how many times you fall. You're measured by how many times you get up. That's the success of any person. We all stumble. We all have failures. But all successful people got up. Literally, you've heard the old expression, they got themselves up by their bootstraps and they continued. The second biggest one is some people don't make the commitment. They get distracted too quickly. They ultimately decide that it's more important to participate in some social events or have a relationship with somebody else, etc. So all of a sudden they start drifting off and say, they keep on thinking they're going to study, but it's going to be next week or next month or maybe the next time. And unfortunately, of course, our lives get so crazy. And then, of course, sometimes they didn't pick the right course of action. What I say is there's also, even in the studying, often the unsuccessful candidate spends way too much time focusing in on what they know because they're good at it and they feel good that they're answering those questions correctly. So they don't look at the things that they really haven't mastered yet. I'll give you an example. In the auditing section of the CPA exam, two of the biggest areas to hit are internal control and evidence. And yet those are the two areas that most candidates had very little knowledge of before they sat for the exam. Understanding the internal controls, they haven't had it yet. They haven't had experience. So they cursory go over it and that becomes a problem. What I always like to do is I like to break it out and make it common sense. Give them easy ways to remember things. 
I'll give you an example. One of them that will say is there's a hierarchy of evidence. When an auditor is looking at evidence to support numbers that management has created, actual knowledge is the most important. Then external evidence, then internal evidence, and then oral representations by management. Well, how are you going to remember that? I tell them it's just like learning your vowels. A-E-I-O-U. A, actual knowledge. A-E, external information. A-E-I, internal information. A-E-I-O, oral representations. And by the way, you will never forget that. So all of a sudden they go, you know, it's corny, but when I went to the exam, I heard your voice. And I literally, when they asked this one question, which one of these evidence is the most useful and supporting, I looked for the one that was actual knowledge. And when I didn't see that, then I went to external. It made it a lot easier for them to be able to grasp on. Those are the kind of things that just, they're quirky, but they're the way my mind thinks. And I've been able to bring those in and help students learn that. And our whole course is built on those kind of memory tools and the ability to analyze those things, which, of course, is so critical for today's CPA exam candidates. Mm -hmm. That is good advice. I'm going to circle back to something you said a little earlier. We did an episode on how to pass the CPA exam, and I had five individuals come on that had just recently passed and talk about their experience. And it's amazing how it just so often comes down to the basics of you have to give up some of your social activities (laughs) and and focus. You have to put in the effort. You know, it, it doesn't matter how much time goes by. Just some of those basics never change. No, they really don't. I always tell people that there's four parts to the exam. You have to get a 75 on each of the four parts. Therefore, you got to get a total of 300 points in total. And I tell them the AICPA says you need a minimum of 300 hours of studying. And I tell them, keep a little chart, set up an Excel spreadsheet. Every hour you put in, whether it's in the classroom or doing the studying on your own, is worth one point. Therefore, if you put in 300 hours, you're probably going to earn 300 points. But do you want to call it that close, where one bad question, one bad answer could maybe throw you off by a point or two? So put in a little extra in each part. But think of it as every hour, you're one point closer to passing the CPA exam. There you go. Well, that is good advice, definitely. Well, before I get to the final questions that I end every podcast with, there's one more. You've had such a successful career and continue to, but I'm really curious with you on this one. Thinking about your own career, if you could go back in time and give your younger self just one piece of critical advice, what do you think you might say? Wow. Great, great question. You know, I'm not sure I can limit it to one, but I can tell you what I would tell myself if I had a few minutes to talk with the younger me. One, I would say, first of all, Keep learning and keep believing in yourself. As we said earlier, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Stay connected. Relationships are everything over your career. And remember, one of the things my mom used to tell me, uh, she was a school teacher herself. She used to say, you can't control what people will do or won't do for you every day. But try to do one nice thing for somebody else every single day. And don't expect anybody to return the favor. Be appreciative when they do. But long-term, your reputation will be as one of the good people in the world. And then the last one I have here that I would think about is keep learning. In other words, like CPE, et cetera. Become a thought leader in your job with your team. For me, CPE allows me to teach, and obviously, I become a thought leader there. I'm able to teach the lectures to major corporations and all their accounting teams. I see how they're learning it, where they're having struggles. And then I'm able to take all of that because it's usually cutting edge, stuff that just came out, which won't be tested on the exam for six more months, and I can master how to teach it. So when I go into the classroom for our CPA review course, I've already taught that lecture multiple times to multiple groups. So I've gotten to see how they learn, where they struggle, where the examples work, and where I need to ultimately manipulate something a little bit extra. Because obviously, becoming a professional is so important. If I can share with you, Mark, one or two interesting aspects about being a professional. Literally, According to magazines, it's the second most in-demand job is being a CPA. It's the third best job listed by U.S. News and World Report. Employment of accountants and auditors is expected to grow faster through the year 2022 than any other occupation, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's huge. And the earnings potential, if you graduate with an accounting degree, your lifetime earnings is potentially about two and a half million. If you get a master's, it's up to 3.2 million. If you get the CPA license, it's expected to be over $4 million. 
So there's a huge opportunity, and we need more CPAs. 75% of today's CPAs are going to retire in the next 15 years, according to the AICPA. So there's a huge opening for all the people listening in to literally fill that void and literally grow quickly into leadership roles. Yeah, the the opportunities really are endless, and certification just opens up doors. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it really removes the ceiling, definitely. Well, I do end every podcast with the same three questions, and so I want to go ahead and get to that. The first one's usually the easiest. From a career perspective, what's been your proudest moment? If you'll allow me, I'm going to break that into two items, professionally, and then I'll do one on personal. Professionally, well, I would say, you know, we, and specifically at Becker CPA Review, 90 to 95% of all the national award winners on the CPA exam every year for the last 15 years have been our students. And the interesting thing is they're not all at the number one tier school. When we look to see, you know, what schools they went to, these are little schools in the Midwest, little schools down south, little schools out west, etc. But they literally made the commitment, they had the confidence, and they chose the right course of action to pass. So that's one of the most important things that I feel. You know, we obviously claim that we have the highest documented passing rate, and I think this goes right along with it. Being asked to present CPE at some of the major corporations has been an incredibly flattering and honor for me. In fact, I actually do training, I do CPE training in the ethics area for the FASB themselves, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Can you imagine standing in front of our rulemaking body and actually having them listening to me? I mean, I'm flattered by that particular circumstance. And of course, as you mentioned, having been recognized as one of the top 100 most influential people in our field was a great, great honor that the accounting today presented. From a personal point of view, it's really the same kind of thing. I'm so honored by the fact that I have been recognized by various groups with various honors. And it's always nice, everyone would agree, that to be recognized in your field. And, you know, it warms your heart. It makes me proud to be in the profession and to see all these young people aspiring to move up the ranks as well. Thank you. I like the way you expanded on that. Well, second one, tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, of course, because that's what we're really going for. But the bigger, the better. Don't hold back. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Can I break that into two, personal and on the business side as well? Sure. Okay. Sure. On the business side, one of the things that I've probably had to learn the hard way is choosing less expensive alternatives is not in your own long-term best interest. Whether it was hiring people and I could hire somebody at X dollars or I could hire this alternative candidate for my company or for anything else at a lower price or in the technology field. You know, at first when I came to Becker, I always wanted to be cost conscious and make sure we stayed within budget. Eventually, I burst out of budgets whenever it was necessary and I always felt comfortable arguing. This is a better product, better technology, these are better people. We need to bring in the best. And there's no substitute that because you get what you pay for. So learning that don't be so price sensitive. Literally make the choice that's going to be for the long term. That's probably the biggest business one. On a personal level, I'm going to go a little bit more corny on you. Probably the thing that I always regret having done. And to this day, my wife rolls her eyes whenever I mention this to anyone. I was in Boy Scouts as a child and I was working my way up to what the highest rank, which is known as the Eagle Scout. And in fact, I had been selected to go to Philmont, New Mexico, which is where the big scout training is done during the summers. And I was in eighth grade, and I took a train all the way from the New York area to Chicago, and then from Chicago all the way down to Philmont, New Mexico, and spent a whole summer in what they called their JLIT, their Junior Leadership Instruction Training Program. Whole summer, I was fully committed to becoming an Eagle Scout, and I was working through the honor ranks, the star and the life. Well, I was also a fairly good athlete, and in my sophomore year in high school, I got a chance to play on the varsity of our football team, which was a state power, and I was allowed to leave our Tuesday practice early at 5 o'clock so that I could shower and I could get to my Boy Scout meeting. And some of the seniors on the team, remember, I was a sophomore, started teasing me, you know, like, really, Boy Scouts? And they were making a little bit of fun of me, and, you know, I wanted to impress them, and I made one of the most foolish decisions for me at the time. I gave up Boy Scouts. I stopped following my dream of becoming an Eagle Scout. And to this day, I always sit there and say, boy, that's one of those things that I really made a mistake on. I didn't follow my dream. I let a short-term goal literally wipe out a long-term ambition that I had. And I still regret it to this day. And my wife will roll her eyes. My kids will sit there and go, really, Dad? But 
Whenever I see a candidate who shows me their resume and I see on their Eagle Scout, I'm so impressed by them because I know they took the time, the years, the commitment, similar to the CPA exam. They were confident they could do it. They made the commitment and they didn't stray from their course of action. I'm glad you shared that. You said it's corny, but it's really a story about giving in to peer pressure. And Mm -hmm. we all experience that no matter how old we are. You know, that's not just a youth item. So thank you. Thank you very much. That's a good one. Well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What's the best piece of advice that you have ever received? You asked some very good questions there, Mark. I'm going to cheat again. Can I give you two thoughts that jump to my head right away? I would be disappointed if we didn't get at least two here. (laughs) (laughs) Hard to limit me, huh? Is that what you're saying? (laughs) One of the first ones was my dad always said, whenever you have to make an important decision, ask which option draws you closer to your long-term goals. And I've always found that to be a great decision maker for me. You know, you have option A and option B. Where do you want to be 10 years from now? In fact, I can remember one story I'll share with you. I was working in public. And I was a senior going to be a manager very, very shortly. And the president of this company came up to me. I was all of, like I said, 25 years old. And he came up to me and said, Tim, you know, do you have a minute? And I walked into his office fearful, thinking maybe I had done something wrong and he was going to, you know, chew me out. Instead, he told me, you know, he really liked me, respected me. And he was hoping that I would be interested in maybe joining his company, leaving public and joining his company. I told him I was flattered. And he said, oh, by the way, I want you to take your car, which, by the way, was a beat up 10 year old jalopy of a car. And he said, I want you to park it in the back lot. And he threw some keys at me and he said, I want you to take this car because this will be your company car. I'm like, well, he walked me down. And it was a brand new Corvette, 25, a Corvette. And he said, take it home over the weekend, think about it, and we'll talk on Monday. All right. I drove it home. And I remember getting home and I drove to my parents' house. And my father looked as he saw this Corvette, brand new one, pulling up into the driveway for a 25-year-old. And he said, what the heck? I don't think the word heck was what he used, but what the heck did you do? And I said, Dad, I got to talk to you. And I said, this guy, blah, blah, blah. And I explained the whole situation. And he looked at me and he said, Is that where you want to be in 10 years? I got so mad because I understood what he was saying. It's nice to have a cool car right now, but is that really the thing that's going to motivate you and keep you motivated? Is this where you want to be? And I realized, no, I wanted to grow in the firm. I wanted to grow and I wanted to have a much more successful practice. So I ultimately turned it down. But I remember that advice and I have followed it my whole life. The second one, this is one from my mother's side of the advice. She said to me, Choose a job you love, and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And you know what? She's been right. I've been so fortunate to be able to work in an area that I love, teaching, accounting, working with people, helping people. And boy, my wife jokes, she says, you get out of bed every day, and it's like, yippee, you're ready to go to work, rather than, oh my gosh, I'm tired, why do I have to work today? And you know, to that extent, I would share with your audience, choice, not chance, is going to be the determiner of your destiny. So choose that job you love. Follow your heart because ultimately it will help make every day an exciting adventure in whatever company you're with. You've really given us a lot of great advice, Tim, this on. This has been a wonderful interview, Tim. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. No problem. Well, for our audience, this has been Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet visited our website, please do so. You can find the show notes for Tim's episode, of course, as well as all our 120 plus now previous episodes. And we have an extraordinary amount of career-related content for accountants as well. Once again, that website is www.whereaccountantsgo.com. On that note, Tim, do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom for the audience? All I would say is make a commitment to the career path that you're looking for. Don't procrastinate because our lives get crazier as we go along. Make that commitment now. Follow my three C's and you will be successful. Beautiful. Well, thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.